The flame that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And just as these stunning concept cars had fired the automotive world's imagination, they were snuffed out and stolen from us. Yes, it's time to strap in for another edition of the Cars Guide podcast, the show that takes you beyond the test drive. This is episode 196, Concept Cars That Should Have Been Built. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and joining me to discuss this travesty, this ongoing game of corporate cat and mouse, is our fearless leader and editor, Mal. Um, Hi, James. And we have a very special guest. He's the sports presenter and a key part of the Seven Network Sunrise team, not to mention the face of Aussie motorsport, Mark Beretta. James Mel, how are you, gentlemen? All right G'day. now, Mark, you're joining us from uh, isolation in hotel mm-hmm. uh, room after your time at the Tokyo Olympics. So thank you Correct. very much for making. Thank you. Uh, your time it's good to talk to people. So thanks. Right. <laughs> Some human interaction. Well, <laughs> um, if that's the best we can do, well, uh, great. Now, and talking cars, fantastic. Fantastic. We'll also open up the B&D roller door and peer into the far reaches of the Cars Guide garage um, in these COVID constrained times looking back on our hero cars and memorable drives. Then we'll dive into your feedback. YouTubers, if you want to plot your own adventure, you can jump ahead courtesy of the time codes in the notes below, and you can click on the chapter markers in the timeline. So let's hit the start button. So concept cars, our own Stephen Otley authored a story during the week, which talked about the ones that stood out for him, the concept cars that had been presented to the world but somehow uh, never stood a chance of, uh, of making it to the showroom. Um, they they uh, are, serve certain purposes, you know, a concept car. They, they either let the design team off the chain. Here you go. You know, they're so often getting the answer no from the bean counters. You can't do that. You can't do this. Yep, go for broke. So there's, there's benefit in that. It's to sometimes gauge, genuinely gauge public opinion on, on a design direction show where a brand's headed and demonstrate what a brand can do. So there are all kinds of reasons why they're out there. So we're going to talk about a group of them um, that we believe should have made uh, the production line. And Mel, this is one that's uh, kind of close to your heart to kick it off with and a name that that resonates with uh, a lot of the Australian motoring public, which is Holden Tirana. This was the, uh, the TT36. Uh, It arrived in the early 2000s and you were there. Uh, you didn't visit the motor show that year, James? Oh, I may have. But oh, okay. um, this is all about you, Mel, as usual. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this is Sydney Motor Show 2004, and they, they whipped the covers off this pink mid-sized sedan uh, with wearing the TT36 badge and Tirana. Yeah. Uh, and it was two years, important to remember, it was two years before we ever saw a VE Commodore. So it was yeah. used to, to preview a lot of VE Commodore bits, and I think the interior was largely the same. Oh, in in um, glorious hindsight, the interior was a VE Commodore interior. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. But uh, shorter wheelbase, shorter front and rear uh, overhangs, and very much a kind of BMW 3 Series, Mercedes C-Class size thing, um, and looking very production ready. Yeah. Um, Mark, were you a, a visitor to motor shows in a professional yeah, capacity or personally? Yeah, Oh, I'm a cars nut. I grew up in Geelong, you know, Detroit. And yes. um, <laughs> I've never heard that before. That's perfect. <laughs> so I love my cars. And um, and I was a Holden family in a Ford town, which was really awkward. Um, but um, I remember the Tirana so well and, and the excitement around it because people just feel an instant passion. You just say the word Tirana to an Australian and it's yes. like, wow, yeah, I remember yeah. that. And I remember what Brocky did with that car. And, oh. you know, it's just, they were a fun car. They were a fast car. Gosh, I remember my mate Russ Bokert had one and he was the hero of the group. You know, he, it was a beautiful car. And he put the little, um, you could get the old uh, Redback Spider gear knob and he'd had that down on the gear. And nice. Like, Whoa, nice. Rex, that's seriously good. That's class. And, um, yeah, I just thought it was it was the right, it would have been the right thing. And I just wonder, you know, if Holden don't regret now not launching with that because you, you look at where cars have gone today and whether that might not have been the, the right move that might have well, just them. Stephen, Stephen theorised, it's interesting you make that point, because Stephen had theorised in the story that it might have been a, a terrific car to slot in under Commodore, yeah. um, and Holden did experiment with some fairly regrettable import cars in that space, one called the Epica, and I remember working at Wheels Magazine, we called <laughs> yeah. it an Epica fail, um, and, and it was followed by the Malibu, that, that neither of which set, yeah. set the world on fire. But Tirana is a name with so much equity um, yeah. with, the, with the Australian public. Mind the other- you, 
it was around about then that we started to shift wholesale towards SUVs and, and yeah. uh, it, it may well have been a zig when everyone else was zagging, you know. The other thing that made it feel so real was that they just brought back the Monaro. So it, we'd watched yeah. it go from concept yeah. to reality and here we are with Tirana. So they're bringing yeah. them all back, you know. The yeah. Monaro yeah. was great. And the TT36 was because it was a 3.6 litre twin turbo V6, right? Is that right? Yep. Yep. Yes. Yep. So whether or not that would have made it through to production, I mean, talk about uh, performance. And Mark, you made the point about Rocky, that that last lap at Bathurst in the A9X <laughs> hatchback where he broke the lap record on the yeah. last lap. Unbelievable. That's, that's something I'll never forget. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tirana. But that, those, those names, they, they carry carry currency, don't they? I mean, the, yeah. the, the Tirana and the Monaro. And uh, remember when the Monaro came back, that was the that was the dream car, the car that everyone mm. wanted to own. Yeah, and then uh, they took that to the mountain. Remember Gary Rogers Motorsport raced that and broke, Rocky drove it in the 24 hours. hours. And yeah. no one got near it. Like, the car yeah. was so good. Yeah. Um, amazing team of four drivers and, and headed up by Brocky. But um, and, you know, and, just a year after, know, they won that 24-hour. And a Pontiac GTO in the States. You know, yeah. it, it was an export model. and, and Took on uh, the world. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. you know, pretty well regarded in America. Some people yeah. uh, were, were a little bit hesitant, but it did well in America as well. So, look, there's our first one out of the box. Crying shame. Piranha should have come back. <laughs> should have been. Um, the next one. He's also kind of a close to home in that a lot of people in Australia, when you say Datsun 1600, it means a lot of things to different people. But for me, it means rally car. It means a great rear wheel drive, little sporty sedan. And in America, it was called the 510. And it's equally uh, kind of iconic over there. And Nissan tapped into that with a concept. It was actually a two prong concept. They called the IDX. And the first one that arrived was a Nismo motorsport-focused, really great-looking thing, and it, it evoked that look of the Datsun 1600. And uh, there was another one called, I want to say, Freestyle. I can't remember the name right now, but there were two versions. One was more your everyday version. One was more your motorsport. And the, the whole place lit up. Everybody wanted to see that car made. And Nissan but, said they were going to make it. Yeah. they were At one stage. They, as it transpires, what they were looking for was a joint venture partner to collaborate yeah. and somehow offset the car, uh, costs um, and make it more economical for them to bring it to market. But um, I was called the IDX Free Flow. I beg your pardon, Free Flow. Sure. Um, and according to uh, to Stephen, that was the sticking point, and they just couldn't make it uh, add up financially. Mm. Yeah. So they said it was going to be rear wheel drive, um, but the you know the big question was what platform would it ride on? Mm. Uh, too small to, to use the same platform as the uh, Infinity Q50. And, you know, I suppose it could have run the Z platform, which was a short wheelbase version of the Q50 platform. But um, I had a gun theory at the time where Nissan never actually said where the engine would be. And looking at the proportions of the concept car, it was pretty small. So, uh, and remember, Nissan uh, was part of the Renault-Nissan alliance. Uh, and... The only one I thought I could think of within the, the sphere was the Renault Twingo, which is rear engine. You're gonna I thought you were gonna say that it was gonna be a rear engine car. Just imagine if they produced it with uh, with the engine in the back in a little sedan body. Talk about instant classic. That is the uh, latest in a series of wild mouth in uh, projections. So <laughs> yeah. that makes, that well, makes we like a mouth sense. fitting going. <laughs> this one's seven years old. It's just not one that's right. Well, it's been um, festering for seven years. It's probably <laughs> grown over time. The um, but if you think about it, it was also about that time that Renault decided to bring back the Alpine name, and uh, such a thing would probably be a bit close to home. Yeah, and it, I, so. I think just at an emotional level. Looking at that car was such a beautiful um, tip of the hat to their heritage, um, and it seemed to create such a lot of positive vibe. But you know, buzz at the time, it's just such a shame uh, that it wasn't made. Because you also had Toyota eighty six Subaru BRZ arriving at the same time. There was a whole kind of rebirth of people wanting sporty rear wheel drive. Uh, cars. Mm. Is it funny when you talk about it like that? I mean, that, these cars, if they had been made, could have changed the direction of the brand. You know, they really could have made such a statement and, yeah. and changed from the consumer's point of view where that brand was heading. Totally. And, uh, you know, they're just moments that I guess, you know, companies look back and say, gee, I, I wish we should have, we could have, you know, we must oh, do it exactly. next time. Exactly. And, and you're that's, right, Mark. That's I the mean, thing, it's brand rather than sales. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. And who knows who's ruling the roost at that time? Somehow, 
the yeah. design department gets one past the keeper and they, they have this car out there in I the think, public and the, I think the, the finance point, team's just going, oh, hold on there, you know. Didn't the, uh, the the gentleman ruling the roost at the time wind up being smuggled into Lebanon in a, uh, in a, a, in a, a music, base case? Musical yeah. case, yes. Well, look, so, glorious a, hindsight. Yes. It's a, that's a whole other story. That's a whole yeah. other podcast. That's a very interesting. There's going to be a movie um, one day, I would say, about, uh, about Carlos. But, uh, Will, let, let's just quickly touch on the next one because most of our episode uh, last time around was around this very car, which is Mazda's on-again, off-again relationship with a new RX sports car, specifically one powered by a rotary engine. And the RX Vision uh, was originally going to be built in 2020 to celebrate the brand's centenary, Mazda's 100th birthday. And it was all on and it was all going to happen. But obviously, things like emissions regulations, uh, a big worldwide shift towards electric mobility rather than internal combustion engines, and, and the rotary engine, its Achilles heel was always its, its emissions. It was never uh, a clean, green kind of engine under the bonnet. Uh, but, but obviously, Mazda is so kind of culturally driven towards wanting this car. It's, it's one that just won't go away. Mm. I, I love it. I think it looks beautiful. I really hope they do it. And, yeah, um, yeah it seems though cars are almost dividing into three streams at the moment. There's the, there's the small car area, there's the SUV area, and there's still the high performance market. And I, I think as much as people say, you know, in environment and electricity and hydrogen, you know, there's still an element of car buyers who, who are heading hard and fast down the road of high performance. And yes. that RX really hits that spot. I think it's, yeah. a, it's, it's a beautiful looking yeah, car. It, and, it's, a, know, it's a thought that's struck me occasionally, Mark, how a large car company reconciles the different parts of its personality. Yeah. In that you have something like, uh, it's now called Stellantis, which incorporates everything from Peugeot and Citroën to Dodge and and Fiat and you name it. Um, but if you have a Dodge Hellcat that has this massive Hemi V8 engine and the other part of your business is working on tiny city car electric, it, it, it's one in one sense diversity, but in another sense, who are you? What, what, yeah. what, what are you doing here? What kind of car company are you? It's sometimes yeah. hard to work out. And what about at the other end, you've got, like you've got the, the Lamborghinis and Aston Martin have just released their DBX, the, the SUV. Um, Ferrari are having a war with their owners about whether they put an SUV out there or not. Yes. Um, so that, you know, they're coming from the other end of high performance, working back down the range. And, and we've seen Aston put out that little small car as well, didn't we, a while ago? As Signet, well? Signet. Signet yeah. was, to, was to get on top of the emissions rigs. They needed, yeah, yeah. They needed so, a clean car. Yeah. Yeah, points so points really mark for a Signet reference. It's a great time in the industry, isn't it? Like there's so much going on and, yeah. and it, it seems to be moving so fast. It's, it, if you're a car lover, it's awesome. Well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned hydrogen because one of the potential roads that Mazda can go down is to use hydrogen as a fuel in an internal combustion engine mm. rather than in a fuel cell to drive an electric motor. So and they have. They're exhausting all avenues uh, to, to try and get there. And, yeah. and we're just innocent uh, bystanders yeah. hoping, hoping that they do it somehow. Yeah. They, they Actually, did. I drove the, um, the Hyundai um, hydrogen car a few weeks ago. Yes. Ah. The sunrise. And um, that was so. really, really impressive. Yeah. But what they made me do at the end was you could collect the um, the output, the water, which they said, no, you can you can drink it. It's just water. Did you have a go? And I drank it. Yeah. It tastes terrific. It was really <laughs> bad. <laughs> right. Do not That's drink right. the output of your car. That's my That's message. Right. That's right. But it is water. And it's, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful message. It's a wonderful thing. And, yeah. you know, so many, um, probably, I guess, the greatest application of it is in, in transport and, and things like buses, you know, yeah. that's. That's yeah. great, and that's where that technology is being used. That's um, true. But it, yeah, it's got application as the technology advances to be used in, in cars as well. It's, it's funny. We, we did a story just a little while ago, a bit of a breakthrough story, where we took that Nexo. Well, put first. It back, put it back to back with Toyota's Mirai and, and drove them in a, in a comparison test and refueled them at the first public uh, hydrogen station in Canberra. And driving behind another fuel cell electric car it looks like the engine's overheating because all you see is vapour coming out from the back of the car. You think, oh, there's something wrong with that. But it's just that the outlet is actually in under the car. Yeah. It's hitting the road and vaporising. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's a, a really interesting topic and, and all mm -hmm. kinds of people are exploring it. You're right in terms of that potential for heavy transport because you don't have to have the big heavy batteries. You can yeah. have a relatively small tank of hydrogen um, so and go a long way. Um, on it and fill up quickly and all those things. But uh, it's how the hydrogen is made is the issue at the moment. Yeah. 
is it made in a clean way or, or an old school dirty way? Yeah. Yeah. Bringing us back to Mazda, um, I Thanks, was there Sam. when they... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, okay. Well, I can segue via hydrogen. They actually produced cool. the hydrogen fuel RX-8 in yep. left-hand, right-hand drive. And I actually drove the left-hand drive one. I remember that. Okay, a- fine. And little tidbit, that actually had a turbo. So Mazda did Ooh. build a turbo RX-8. I think I might have mentioned it in the podcast before. But um, so having, so being a part of that, that reveal of that car and Mazda saying, we're going to bring back the rotary, et cetera, I've, I've met several of the 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 high and mighty uh, executives at Mazda and like Mazda has this great culture where, you know, they, they sort of retain people and build them up from lower levels right up to the top. And now as a result, you know, they really build Mazda people and it's funny. They, they just get misty eyed when you mention yeah, rotary. They're so the romance of it. They're just so committed to it, even though they've tried and failed, tried and failed, tried and failed numerous times in the past. Fantastic. All right. So, Will. I suppose where there's hope, um, there's possibility. So we'll mm. we'll see. We'll see what happens. Let's let's move on to the next one, which is a Hyundai, um, and it's called RM Twenty E. Uh, it's a mid-engine sports car that may seem far-fetched from a brand like Hyundai, but the company, according to Stephen, has explicitly said it would like to develop just that kind of car uh, and make it electric or at least hybrid. And everything seemed to be rolling towards that, uh, that ambition. They, Hyundai made an investment in Rimac, which is a Croatian EV supercar specialist. So you're thinking, all right, they're going to be able to borrow a lot of technology from there. Um, and they'd made a series of you know, racing midship concepts. Um, this thing would have been packing 596 kilowatts, which is probably about five or six times more power than you really need. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, but recent comments from Hyundai management suggest they're having second thoughts. So for whatever reason, the whole in performance thing has been very successful for Hyundai so far. But at the moment, this looks like just a little bit of a bridge too far um, for mm. them. Have you heard anything on it now? Uh, well, nothing more than what Steve's reported. But um, it's interesting, like this all, this mid-engine idea seemed to start when uh, Hyundai sort of returned or really started its big push and rallying. And, you know, the idea of a mid-engine right. hatchback, that's pure golden era rallying. Um, and I think, you know, this sounds uh, a bit like Hyundai's Jacatalo, which, you know, which, James, you were talking about a few weeks ago. And yeah. that didn't work, but I wish it did. <laughs> and I wish the Hyundai one would too, even if it's got an electric motor in the back. Like, yeah. that'd be awesome. It, it's Hyundai to me, it'd be interesting to get your thoughts, Mark, but Hyundai to me is a brand that has come so far so quickly. Mm. Um, they're pushing out in all directions. You know, they've created their luxury brand in Genesis and they've gone yeah. very hard on sporty models and into motorsport, motorsport, as you say, Mel, World Rally Championship. Um, TCR. It, it, it's like a youthful brand yeah. trying everything, you know, one, wants to get out there very energetic and, and very excited. And it, you get the feeling they'll settle down at some point and work out actually who and what they are. Yeah. Remember there was a push, I reckon it was probably maybe five or six years ago they were coming into supercars. Remember when uh, we were talking about different brands coming in and, and Hyundai were right there, they had a good look at it. And uh, I remember, I think at the time they were working with Scafi when, when he and Neil were, were sort of developing the, the next series of the new supercar. And uh, yeah, they, they had a serious crack at it, but it didn't come, but you know, it's still somewhere on the drawing board. There are some plans there to, to do a car like that. But it I think seems so logical, did not it? Bread and butter is... Yeah, it did, yeah, it was, um, and a great way to elevate yourself in the Australian market too, straight up. But yeah. they're bread and butters, those little cars. And I have recently had the pleasure of in, investing in my daughter's i20, uh, which uh, I, I've driven it a few times. It's a good little car, you know, for, yeah. for the money you pay and, and what it is. They're a really good, safe little car. And, uh, you know, it just shows they've got that foundation, you know, they've got that 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 base audience. And you, you look at the amount of i30s and, um, and i20s that are out there now, i30s in particular, Yes. And, uh, you know, they've got something really solid to build on. So, you know, sort of where they go from there will be interesting. Well, Mark, we've, we've said it before that um, what's gone from a question mark, you know, a couple of decades ago, mm. Hyundai, has now, as far as we can ascertain, become every much uh, as a credible option yeah. as Toyota, Nissan, like Toyota, Nissan, Hyundai, Kia, you know, they're all roll yeah. off the top. In, in and the and they're all models... Models. Models like the Santa Fe have become a go-to family totally. vehicle totally. for mainstream yeah. Australia. And, yeah. and 
people are happy to spend a lot on the top end versions of them, yeah. uh, right. which is why they brought us the Palisade, which starts at sixty thousand dollars with eight seats. Um, well, next up, mid mid engine electric supercar for Hyundai. So um, seems like a logical step. Um, <laughs> we'll 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 move on now uh, to another automotive giant in the shape of Volkswagen, and obviously having a strong European focus. They're into uh, electric mobility in a huge way. And they've had various concepts under the banner of ID. So they've had the ID Buzz, which is going to be the reborn combi, which is a really cool thing. And lots of people have been clamoring for Volkswagen to make that. In 2019, they pushed the ID idea uh, in the direction of a buggy. So it was the ID buggy concept. And it was very much redolent of the Myers Manx uh, classic 1960s into the 70s beach buggy where you put your fiberglass body on top of your VW Beetle and bingo, you had that kind of fun car. It looks amazing. I wonder whether there would be a market for such a car is the question. Yes, please. You reckon? <laughs> yeah, great. I, I, love, I, love, I think it's awesome. I think yeah. you know, if you look at the, at the moment, the way we're moving more to the beach culture, I mean, what's Byron Bay's got some of the most expensive property in the, in the country now and People are, are reassessing in this time what they what they want to do and how they want to live. Yeah. That car for our, our coastline, I'm thinking New, northern New South Wales, up through Queensland, yeah. Great Ocean Road, down that way. You know, if you've got your little beach house, you're bound to have a buggy. Remember the success of the Mini Moke? When I was oh, growing up, you know, everyone wanted to get, wanted to get their hands on a Mini Moke. And uh, I think the buggy could take that spot. It, it's, a, it's a great idea. And it looks cool and it's a fun car. And as soon as you get in it, you just go, hey, I feel yeah. good. Now, this was from another time, but I will admit to, in my first job at high school, I shared a paper round with my mate and we delivered papers in a mini moat. <laughs> and we discovered that if you could hook your feet under the passenger, it was a tubular frame seat, you could fit your feet in there, and then your thighs onto the edge of the box frame chassis and lean out in left-hand corners. It was a bit <laughs> like a motorcycle sidecar, so you could really get some hooking in the left corners. So highly illegal, but very quick uh, way to get. Thanks. The paper, You've got a yachting around. background too, haven't you? That's right. Yes. So there was a bit of that. We should have put a <laughs> yeah, trapeze on the side, but right out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but you're right. That's such an interesting point of view that there would be particular parts of the world that would leap all over a car like that. But uh, yeah. it seems like you know it's 2019. It's now 2021. It's gone at least to the back burner, if not. Um, I think. Uh, I think crash safety might be the biggest of challenge. Course. Of course, yeah, that's yeah. a great. However, thing. however, what a great opportunity to demonstrate your active safety features if you can prevent yes. the, the crash from ever happening. Yeah, it's okay yeah. to have a completely open roof vehicle with no doors. If well, the crash I mean, for, for for some long time now. Um, into, you know, I think back to Merck SL that had the immediate pop-up roll bar. You oh, know, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. In, the, in the same instant as an airbag will deploy. Uh, R129, mm. I think, Mel, correct me if I'm wrong, but it had the... the oh, the Princess Die one. Bar. Yeah, and mm. you could do something like that maybe to, to make it, but it, it, it all costs money, doesn't it? And um, you've got to weigh that up against uh, the potential for it in the market. All right, now, the last one that Steve called out um, is an extension of the Hyundai brand, Genesis, as we mentioned, their luxury brand, called the Essentia, and um, it is really quite something. It's a pure sports car. Um, now, it was unveiled in 2018 at the New York Motor Show. What a great location to, to put something like that on public display. But more recently, as in earlier this year, had a Genesis X concept, which is more of a GT and electric Grand Tourer, which is beautiful. Genesis has really got its design game going very well. Uh, but this one is a little bit older and probably more purposeful. Um, it, it looks more flat out. This is a performance car. And Steve is just bemoaning the fact that it, that it never actually got near the production line. I'm kind of with him. It's a beautiful car. Um, I'm presuming you guys both had a look in the story. What do you make of it? I think the fact that it's a coupe is uh, somewhat limiting. Like, why would you push with a coupe when the world clearly wants SUVs? Um, however, we're, we're talking Genesis, though. Now. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's a premium kind of thing. So you can possibly experiment in that space a little more. But Porsche's learnt, Ferrari's about to learn, Lamborghini's learning. Like, this is what's like. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, I think, I think the, the, the point of the coupe is it kind of gives the stylists the chance to exercise their design freedom. And, you know, maybe if you're introducing a new um, 
design theme, that's the way to do it. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, Genesis already has some SUV models. They have some sedans. So I suppose they're pushing out into that premium coupe kind of area at the same time as demonstrating what they can do in terms of making a beautiful um, extended coupe type car. Mm. Uh, you guys have just reminded me, I am the uh, only person in the world going against the international global trend of SUVing. I am going from an SUV into a coupe. There you uh, go. Awesome. I, I am going against the flow of the world at the moment. So <laughs> that's a good thing or not. Yeah, there's nothing like zigging when everyone else a is A two-door <laughs> coupe, Mark? <laughs> Sorry? A two-door coupe? Yes. A genuine coupe. Wow. Oh, no. That's good. That should be the, the subject line of this podcast. That's, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, against the trend. Brilliant. Now, just to extend things for, for very briefly, I had a handful that at the time I thought these have to be made um, but weren't. There was one in 2012. It's called the Chevrolet Code 130R, and it was a little two-door, four-seat, um, rear-wheel drive sports car that Chevrolet put out on display um, it was at the time of 86 and BRZ. It could have been Chevy's and a Hol it could have been a Holden Tirana. Um, it could have been all kinds of things. It was on that Alpha architecture that the Camaro um, went on to, a little 1.4 litre naturally aspirated engine. Um, it was potentially going to be a mild hybrid, um, not hugely powerful, but a six-speed manual or a six-speed auto. And another one that was kind of crushed by the move to SUVs, but I really wanted to see that car. Chevrolet's one series. Yeah, and the, the other was similarly in GM, but at the other end of the scale was the Cadillac Seal um, oh, in 2011. It, it's a four-seat convertible. Um, it's big. It's 5.2 metres long. Like, it's a proper Cadillac. Um, twin turbo, 3.6-litre V6 hybrid, but it had nickel-plated trim, Italian olive wood in the, in the interior, machined aluminium. You still might be getting hot. Hand tipped leather. I had and to that's work, the I had romance to and, the Cadillac brand, isn't it? I had to go and find out what hand tipped leather Opulent. is. Opulent. It's just some kind of very high quality Italian leather, yeah. big 22 inch rims. It looked like that's what a Cadillac should be a, an up off kind of thing that everybody <laughs> everybody just looks yeah. and, and, and stands and, uh, and stares at. And, and it did have its influence on subsequent Cadillac yeah. models. See, I find I find that car spectacular. I think it's yeah. absolutely beautiful, and and just the the grunt of the front of it. It reminded me when I first looked at it. If you remember back to the Thunderbirds, yeah. <laughs> the oh, was, totally. um, big Rolls Royce had a big grunt in front. Now you're talking. Tape it yeah. off, and and that's the impression I got from that car. But in black, like they're sort of floating oh. the pictures around in black. It's an awesome car, and it yeah. just looks like fun and grunts on the road and, and good American tradition. The, the, and the other one that I, at the time, this is way back, we're going the way back machine, to 1991, Audi created a concept called the Arvus uh, Quattro. It was 1991 in Tokyo and I was at that show and I saw it and I just kind of stood there stunned uh, like a mullet because it was incredible. It was a mock-up, but it was had an entirely alloy exterior and it kind of evoked the auto union streamliners of the, the late 20s and 1930s. Absolutely. Um, Six liter W12. So this was as the VW group was developing that W12 engine. Um, and it was kind of peak Piac. It was Ferdinand Piac trying to rule the world. And he created this amazing car. And the track, the Arbus track, which is just outside Berlin, I visited that as well. And it's madness. And just to think of this car being built, I really thought, oh, come on. You know, it, it, it would be brilliant if they'd made it. Um, all right. So that, that is our rundown on all of the concepts that we think should have been made. Uh, thank you, guys. Now, we'll move to our garage. And as I said, we can't really drive cars um, a heck of a lot these days. So we're delving back into the past and covering our memorable drives or cars or whatever it might be. And Mal, you have got a cracker. Please fill us in on this one. Sure. Uh, it was 10 years ago in March this year that uh, I embarked on my biggest automotive adventure to date uh, with a couple of good mates. I set off from Sydney GPO on a Sunday morning, uh, just on the road, just down the road from Brecky Central, Mark, uh, in a 20-year-old G100 Daihatsu Charade we bought for $450 with the intention of driving to Perth GPO as quick as we could get there. Had, had you talked them down on oh. the 450 mil or was that full ticket price? Did you have a... Uh, any oh, negotiation that, on that? That was that was someone else's problem. Okay, gotcha. 
Uh, the, so that's 4,000 kilometres with a three-cylinder car with just 38 kilowatts uh, and 250,000 kilometres on the Odo and a whole lot of ambition to get there in under 40 hours. Um, Gee. We planned it to the letter, a lot like a Bathurst Enduro, uh, with fuel stops paired with driver swaps, carefully managed nutrition and hydration uh, to avoid any other stops. Well, it, it was carefully managed nutrition, like servo pies and a No, we had multi-grain sandwiches with vegetables and oh, wow. uh, yeah, and chia time, seeds Mel. in water to you know to minimise uh, wastage of hydration. Um, Amazing. Politely put. Uh, and yeah. I put an extra fuel tank in the boot. So we had 77 litres of fuel on board. Uh, and that meant the fuel gauge read full until you burned the first 40 litres. Or uh, certified, I'm sure. Oh, definitely. Yeah, um, sure. Personally certified. certified. Um, and you know what? We drove through a whole day, one whole night, and another whole day. And we got to Perth GPO just as the sun was setting on day two. In 37 hours, 43 minutes and wow. 22 seconds. Wow. Well Very done. Impressive. That's amazing. It was quite a buzz. Uh, yep. And we managed to beat our goal by two hours and 16 minutes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, we sprayed passion pop at the finish line and <laughs> went to bed. Um, and then right. we spent the next two weeks driving back, taking in the sights and had an absolute ball. Uh, I think we wound up doing 10,000 Ks in total over two weeks. Okay. And the only mechanical fault we had was one of the number plate screws fell out. Oh, you're uh, kidding. That, and that's it. Someone and is that, the vibration. Is that <laughs> car in the uh, National Motor Museum, I presume? Yeah, it should be. No, fun. it's heading that way. Uh, oh. It still lives today. It's been owned by four of my mates now. Oh. And the one who owned it at the time uh, recently bought it back and it's now on club plates because it's uh, Beautiful. 30 years old. Beautiful. Uh, so it's just amazing the sorts of things you can fall in love with. And mm. this little fridge on wheels certainly deserve that. Sure. So, anyway. Well, you've, in fact, charade is a bit of a positive trigger word for you, isn't it, Mal? As soon as you, you hear that word, your whole face lights. I don't hear it much, though, these days. No, but, no. yeah, you're right. <laughs> that's right. And that's not a bad thing. <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Now, um, thank you very much, Mal. That is incredible. Mark, we'll move on to yourself. What have you? Uh, you, you what do you reflect on as a, as a uh, fabulous episode? If you can imagine a story that's the furthest away from Mal's, this is... <laughs> <laughs> so my, my memorable drive, and, and it's still, it was golden. I remember every moment of it. Um, but there was a guy called uh, Marcel Fabrice who ran Aston Martin in Australia. And I'd got to know him through, through the cars. And um, I was going to, my wife's from England. She's uh, Chester in the north of England. And we were going over for a family trip. So I, I rang Marcel and said, look, we'll be over. I'd, I would love to see the Aston plant. And he organised it. And uh, we went in the Aston plant, which is unbelievable. You do expect 007 to sort of walk out around the corner anytime and um, you go and you've probably seen the, the front display as a, a car sort of sitting on the water and then you go inside and all the great models are lined up there's probably a dozen or so of them and it's it's just magnificent and everything's handmade so the craftsmanship and the pride and the immaculate workspace is just incredible I've never seen anything like it so I was completely blown away and then I'm walking out at the end and you have um, not so much reception more of a sort of concierge at the front of Aston Martin and he says to me oh, uh, Mr Beretta uh, we have organised a car for you for the afternoon. And I'm like, this is my dream. So I'm going to drive an Aston Martin through the English countryside. And I've got a, a mate with me. And Ian and I jump in this car and we, we're just, we're pinching each other. Um, it was a Vantage V12 um, convertible. So we popped the top back. It was a nice sunny English day. We're driving through the countryside and the roads are beautiful. They're made for Astons. You can just really have some good fun. And because it's in Gaydon, where the factory is, everywhere we go, everyone recognises the car and gives you a wave and they tip a hat and, oh, you're driving an Aston. It's fantastic. Fabulous. So, and we found a classic little English pub. We pulled in there for a... Um, a roast lunch and a, maybe a pint or two and then um, drove this beautiful car back and, and cried when we had to give it back to us. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, with some beautiful memories. Actually, we did, we caught up with the girls. Our, our wives were down, uh, they were in a little town up the road and we sort of rolled into town in our beautiful uh, Vantage V12 with the roof off and the girls had a good laugh at us. So it was, that was, it was beautiful. It was, a, it was the perfect driving day. The nice thing yeah. about that is that um, most of the time in a British summer, the sunlight is there, but it's quite gentle. So you Absolutely. can actually put, as opposed to it being this 
brutal beating mm. sun in Australia. Mm. Skin off, Convertibles skin off. are better at, at night, really, in the yeah. summertime here. But during the day, that sounds like such a lovely drive. Yeah, it was it was beautiful. And having having grown up in Geelong, the Great Ocean Road, I've, I've been down many times, and I find that the best time to drive that is at sunset on a Friday afternoon. There's nothing yeah. like being on the Great Ocean Road. Oh wow! Just like the postcards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that is great. That is a very evocative. Hey, did uh, I have a question? Did the concierge, uh, were they wearing a lab coat and going by the name of Q? By any <laughs> That's right. I wouldn't be surprised. The wrong guy. Based, based on the, the aura they yeah. created around that experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're just no, worried when he holds up his, you're worried, um, whoops, you're worried when he holds up his watch and starts, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Or, yeah. or hands you a pen. <laughs> correct, yeah. Yeah. correct. But um, it is an amazing place. That What they do there with the leather work, you know, the, the craftsmanship, I'd, I can't imagine anything like it. You know, when you think, you know, those dashes that are all leather and they're all completely, you know, handmade from the one piece of cowhide is is remarkable. It's probably hand-tipped because I now know what hand-tipped. Um, anyway, <laughs> thank you, Mark. That's fantastic. Um, mine, and it's kind of in, in honour of you joining the podcast, Mark, was I had the opportunity to drive um, what I now, I was thinking was a V8 supercar it's so long ago, but it was actually... I think a Group A car. It was Thomas Mazera's VP Commodore and the HRT uh, team, Holden Racing team at Oran Park, just the South Circuit, the smaller Mm. circuit. It was a suburb. What a a tragedy that that circuit uh, no longer exists. Um, But it was for Motor Magazine when I was there. It was going to be a series where I drove um, certain cars, but sadly events conspired um, to to knock that on the head. But there I was. It was it was. A really, really fun experience. I spun the car gently, stayed mm-hmm. on the black stuff, as you might expect. I over revved the engine on the down change. I didn't break any valves or, you know, anything too tragic. But I was very pleased to hear that one of the engineers said that's just exactly what Wayne Gardner did the first time he drove the car. So, <laughs> Whoa. Um, and it was, it was easy and, as I say, great fun to drive. But it was obvious that that's fine. A lot of people can do that. But then finding that limit and going consistently fast and, and doing that lap after lap is where the professionals take over. So mm-hmm. it was just a, a really great little window into that world. In mm-hmm. fact, the techs didn't want any more laps on the engine. They weren't thrilled about the whole thing in the first place. <laughs> so I was getting a fairly um, negative vibe from those guys. But, <laughs> yeah. um, Don't but engineers I, love that. <laughs> but I, I got there and got there anyway and, and did what I had to do. And I've got this little collection of 50 diecast models that represent these drives and things and and people on youtube will see there's my model of that particular car so it's in the 50 uh, cabinet it was it was quite the afternoon it was on yeah. was it the full that, circuit sorry that's my, that's no no my just the smaller one the south circuit mm. so you're just zipping around but that that was enough that was great <laughs> tell me did it did you have that feeling that the car had so much more still to go that it was sort of an, almost a, a, a I, massive I that, power there that you didn't get to tap into that's, that's the tap dance. That's the balancing act because you knew that the engine, well, on that day anyway, um, could easily overpower the tyres and you were trying to just yeah. find that limit and stay on it and walk that fine line. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, give me 100 laps and I probably could have put in a decent lap time. Yeah. Put a pro in there and they'll do it within two or three laps. You know, yeah. they've got the seat time, they've got the experience yeah. and they can do it. So you knew you could, could sleep, kind of see where you could go with it, um, but not do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, yeah. you had a crack yeah. and every now and then it came together, but that's where the professionals you know, mm. really, you, really know. You're very smart, James, I think. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that's during the time where there's next to no aero on the cars. You know, they had a, a, right. a rudimentary front splitter and a, a fiberglass mm. rear wheel. Yeah, yeah. But, you Imagine know, what these days. It's like it's an empty car. It's just the shell. It's got the roll cage, and you're just it's echoing around. It was a really, um, but and yet super easy, super uh, friendly to the driver. Yeah. Um, they are they're a brutal environment though aren't they i mean the <clears> times i've been in for a ride it's it's hard to imagine that a the, the thing that gets you is just the a the noise yeah. um the the heat mm. um, because there's just not much between you and the engine and just the the, the brutal suspension you know it's yeah. there yeah. hardcore and yeah. you know after three or four laps i find i get out in a race suit sweating so yeah you know how would how drivers sit through multiple shifts in a bathurst 1000 totally. Is no, incredible. Yeah. Well, because it was such a treat, you know, for me, I had the, the smile actually went up to my ears. I was kind of <laughs> creased. I didn't care about the text or what. They <laughs> I just had a drive in a Group A um, Commodore. So yeah. um, no, it was it was it was fantastic. Yeah. All right, good. 
Thank you for that, guys. Now, what we will now do is move to feedback from the last issue. Um, and last episode, we were talking about a car that we've touched on today, which is the Mazda RX, uh, more specifically an RX rotary. Uh, and we were talking through the scenarios and the potential for where uh, that car may, may appear from. Now, Bill Katapotis got in touch and said he thinks Mazda needs a halo vehicle. You know, um, he says those of us that are older than 45 have fond memories of what Rotary was to Mazda. To your point, Mal, earlier about the long-termers at Mazda feeling that, that joined at the hip connection with a, a Rotary engine and, and sports cars, et cetera. No matter how good the mainstream cars are today, without the excitement of halo vehicles, their market share will fall, which is a big call. But do you agree with that, Mal? Uh, I don't profess to be a businessman. I just uh, <laughs> I'm happy to, to, to judge the cars, but it is interesting, like that the current halos are kind of split. Um, in that the CX9 is, you know, the big halo across the US and in Australia, but it's too big to sell in Japan, where right. you know the the equivalent is the CX8, and yeah. that, that's the the halo in um, Japan. So, I, I it would make sense to have one halo car that could be sold across all markets. Um, but uh, that's all I'll say. Yeah. Well, look, Bill was also kind enough, and just to beat our own chest for a sec, he says, keep this up and we may see you guys on mainstream TV to replace Top Gear. There is no intelligent automotive current and historical discussion in Australia on TV, which makes me look forward to this every week. So more power to you, Bill. Thank oh, you. Good. Thank you very much. Look forward now, to that. We'll, we'll find a spot. I think Seven Mate is just screaming for this show. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Heard it first. Perfect. Um, now, our old mate Hammer Rocks also made a point about uh, Mazda and Rotary and the RX. He says what we're all thinking. Mazda is a big tease um, and, in fact, thinks they may fall into the trap of doing a Honda um, with the NSX, which actually, in his view, turned to be a little bit outdated by the time it arrived. And it put me in mind, you know, Honda had been playing around with replacing that original NSX for so long. Back in 2007, they produced a front-engine V10 Acura, which was, which was going to be, you know, a, um, a replacement for the NSX. Then they went in a completely different direction. And by 2012, they had the concept of what ultimately was the more contemporary NSX. But Mal, you and I drove that car. When was it? It would have been 2018, 2019 by the time I uh, got the chance to drive it. I think it was 2019. But 2019? You know, it, was a, it was a half million dollar car. Ah, it and was, this it is was, a company that... You know, exactly. it's, it's, it predominantly sells forty to fifty thousand dollar, you yeah. know, CRVs. Yeah, yeah, it was it was an outlier, that's for sure. I mean, mm. terrific car to drive, but for that kind of money, you're in McLaren territory, you're in Lambo land, and, mm. and all that kind of stuff. It's a that's why a different world. But mm. but Hammer also made the point that Subaru is a serial offender here. Um, they release gorgeous concepts as a design direction, but that never translates to the real world. Well, and the one the one that I came to my mind was the 2013 WRX concept. And I thought, if they make that, it's going to go off. Um, yeah. And they didn't. <laughs> For people on YouTube, there'll be a picture of it on screen. They'll probably remember it, but it never happened. Uh, well, they have they have actually followed through with this sort of thing. Remember the SVX? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it arrived at a time where Subaru was selling sports wagons with all-wheel drive to the Snowy Mountains and Tasmania. Mm. Uh, but then they had this 74, I think it was $74,000 you know, yeah. uh, Jigaro designed two-door yeah. coupe with, you know, yes, Countach-esque windows and yes. uh, et cetera, et cetera. They had to kind uh, of realise who they were. So yeah. that didn't work. And that was right. only kind of three times the price of a standard model, yeah. let alone one that was eight times the price like the NSX was to a CRV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit it's reminiscent of Lexus for a time there where they seemingly didn't know who they were. You're building little hybrid hatches and a front-engine V10 hypercar. So, you know, where, where is Lexus at? Um, Subaru, I think, has since settled down and they, uh, they're in their lane and they, they know what they're doing. But uh, I certainly hear what Hammer has to say. Um, our old mate Birdie, he says that the red rotary, being the RX Vision that we were looking at last, uh, last week, looks like a Mazda stylist has pushed a Play-Doh Mazda 3 model down and out uh, to create the RX. And I reckon he's spot on because when yeah. you think about the styling of Mazda in the last decade, it's all based, I didn't know this person's name, so I did a bit of digging. It's Ikio Maeda, who since 2009 has been head of uh, Mazda Design. 
And he created initially a sculpture. And I've seen this sculpture and people on YouTube, there'll be a picture of it um, on screen. It's just this metallic free form design that has different curves, lines, edges, shapes. Mm -hmm. And it was called Kodo and Kodo means heartbeat in Japanese. So they called it the soul of motion. And they created an initial uh, concept car called the Shinari. And everything that followed from that for, for the next 10 years has referred back to that sculpture and that first concept car. And that's why you've had that consistency of appearance in Mazdas. And I think it's always a subjective thing, but I think they're very attractive cars. Mm. And, and Mazda has been super consistent in referring back to that as their model for design. Mm. So I think it is a bit like a piece of Play-Doh that you do move out into, into different well, shapes. The thing is, these forms are created using clay, which is not too far removed from Play-Doh. True, true. So, mm. that's yeah. our old, They're um, just squishing it or pulling it out for a different model. Right. That's right. <laughs> yes. Um, now, Lofty Visions, um, our old mate Lofty, I hope Lofty Jr. is doing well, uh, Lofty. He, he loves the rotaries, and he had a Series 1 RX-7 many moons ago. It was great fun and didn't fall to bits like his old MG midget. So that's a, <laughs> that's a great outcome. And... We had a quick discussion on fake noise or synthetic noise that is either um, the engine and exhaust uh, are supplemented through the audio mm -hmm. system in the car, or there's some kind of piping of the engine induction noise into the cabin or, or whatever, um, as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing or whatever. Anyway, uh, Lofty says it might be him getting uh, uh, older, but he quite likes the piped in noise in his Yaris GR. He's a lucky person he has a Yaris GR. Um, enjoyment without annoying the neighbours. And he actually used a <laughs> dongle and an app to switch it off. It ended up turning it back on again because he, he decided he liked it. So um, that, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of trouble getting my head around that. I mean, you guys would have driven cars with that. What's, what's the experience like? The, the, sometimes the experience is so good that it's only when someone taps you on the shoulder later and they say, you know, that's synthetic. Oh, wow. Really? You know, and it's, um, it's just one of those things where psychologically you probably want it to be genuine, not artificial, mm. and there's something in your mind that goes, oh, I feel a bit shortchanged. Mm. Um, that's, yeah. how it, that's how it affects me anyway. Others, yeah. like Lofty, no, nah, he's all for it. So mm. it's just one of those things. Sometimes it's, it's as cheap as, you know, barbecue plastic plates, mm. but um, others are putting a lot of effort into this. And as we yeah. transition to electrification, yeah. um, brands are really, really trying to sort of preserve the experience of driving and, the, and you know, the, all the sensory the you know, orchestrating, feedback. Orchestrating a sound yeah. to, to and accompany the drive, yeah. And Audi had sound engineers on, you know, making mm. noises for electric cars yeah. nearly 10 years ago, or probably 10 years ago, actually. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I know firsthand that Mercedes is putting a lot of work into creating a signature sound for AMG electrified mm. models. And, yeah. you know, AMG is all about the sound. Yeah. So it's it's a big risk for them to move to electrification. But I don't know what that sound will be, but I'm dying mm. to hear it. Well, it's yeah. a bit, I mean, we were saying uh, last week that if you're up front in that way, it's an electric vehicle. So by definition, it's not going to have the noise of an internal combustion car. You're going to go for something that's probably a bit different and quite distinctive. That's fine. But supplementing the noise of an internal combustion engine in the engine bay or its exhaust or whatever, mm. it's kind of a different thing. Yeah. Um, mm. yeah, it's almost subterfuge. But once you're aware of it, it just depends on how it strikes yeah. you, I suppose. It's an interesting thing. Is like I, I just find it, um, I, look, I had a C63 for a while and I loved it and I love the sound of AMGs. I think it's, a, it's the most beautiful tone. Um, but it's also about, I wonder if through your hearing, you're sort of also measuring the performance of the car from, you know, you, you know the characteristic of the car when you accelerate or when you do this, yes. when you're cornering and yeah. what it should sound like. I wonder if it's even more than just the sound, but yes. it's part of our whole experience of driving the car where we, we actually use the sound to sort of have a, have a good idea of where we are with the car. It's you know? true. I think not, also, not just the noise. It's easy to downplay, you know, the exhaust as a relatively modest element of the driving and ownership experience. Mm. But with your AMG, I'm sure every time you got in and just started the car, that's an enjoyable part of, of having the thing. Because it's just, oh, right. You know, I mean, I mean, it's it's all kinds of things, not just the driving, but I think that's a really interesting point. Mm. But you're right, it, it could open a, a wider, a broader kind of safety concern, you know, as cars become more 
you know, more of a bubble around us and we, mm. we don't feel the sensation of speed running down the, the motorway. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's true. You know, I know when I hop in my K20 Corolla and I'm in fourth gear at 100 k's an hour and things rattling like a paint shaker, <laughs> I don't want to go any faster. And I, <laughs> and I shouldn't go any faster. <laughs> but uh, hop in a brand new Corolla and, you know, it'll sit on 160 if you let it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. That's, that's uh, risk compensation theory. So mm. it says the safer a car is, the more capable it is, the faster you'll drive it, the yeah. more, you know, you'll go up to its limit. Yeah. Um, but... I do remember sitting, waiting to be picked up, uh, having returned a, a loan vehicle at one point, and our good friend Tim Keane turned up in a uh, Outlander PHEV, and it was in electric mode, and it was making that Jetsons kind of humming noise, <laughs> and it came up near my ear and went, wow, that's the future, you know? <laughs> it was that warn the pedestrians that there's a vehicle here kind of noise, yeah, yeah. which is super yeah. sci-fi, and I thought it was really fun. Yeah. So, so the AMG would always warn the pedestrians it was nearby. That's right. You'd win in no doubt. <laughs> for about <Brilliant>. 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> no need for soft bonnets or, you know, active bonnet uh, airbags, right. et cetera. Now, um, there were also, we probably haven't got time to go through them all, but there were a lot of people, Chesto put in a challenge to say, look, in the last five years, we were talking about um, design icons. What's the car that, that is, has, has just lived in people's memory and changed the landscape. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were talking about E-Type Jaguar and, and various others. And we got everything, thanks to everybody uh, that, that fed back, we've got everything from Porsche Taycan to Hyundai Ioniq 5, ZR Corolla, um, Aston Martins, there you go, Mark, um, <laughs> and the Lotus Amira. We had the Honda E, which is that beautiful little compact electric car, Bugatti Devo, um, other ones, the 917 concept from Porsche. Um, so, yeah, look, thank you very much, but we just haven't got time to go through them all. It's a big spread, isn't it? It is. It is. It, it, it reflects the subjective nature of these yeah. things, doesn't it? But uh, um, TGV finished it off and he said, where is Matt Campbell these days? And it reminded me, so Mark, Matt is, uh, is, is one of our colleagues and he's a regular on the podcast. I'd, be, I'd neglected to mention where he is. He and his significant other um, actually welcomed a baby daughter um, oh, just a little while ago. So he's on paternity leave and TGV says, thank you, pass on our best. So just to explain, that's why Matt hasn't been in the cast in recent times. So and late, you'll be back. You'll be back reasonably soon. So better late than never to explain that one. So look, with that, we have reached the finish line. And I want to say thank you, Mel. And thank you very much for joining us, Mark. It's been terrific. Oh, it's yeah, great, no. guys. It's great, great, great to talk cars and share some old stories, and um, just love your passion. And what uh, I think I I do as a as a consumer is I look to you guys for for advice on cars, and I I did that with the car I, we bought for Ava, and you know I I you lose touch with certain I guess you know series of cars or I guess stages of cars, and I certainly had with that, that you know that little yeah. first car um, genre, if you like. So you know I I turned to you guys, and the you know the advice was was good you know and oh, it's, um, we appreciate it and i think for, for all of us out there you know it's um it's great to have you guys at the forefront just checking and making sure things are, are what they should be and um you know and advising us on on what is good and we, and we have a we better. have a lot of cyclical friends so yeah. we know people for about three months they yeah. go into the the purchase cycle yeah, and then we'll see you in three years then yeah. see you later you know <laughs> yeah. but um that's that's terrific and i, I also want to say thanks to our production operative Head of schmoozing and spa concierge, Mr. Pritchard, for his nimble finger work on the buttons and sliders. Uh, today, he's wearing a T-shirt saying, cleverly disguised as a responsible adult. Um, neon snakeskin pants and Crocs, but not the kind you're thinking of. People on YouTube will know what I'm saying. Jump into the conversation. Cars Guide is on Facebook and Instagram or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. Apple podcast listeners, please take a moment to rate and review the show. Five is the preferred number of stars. Thank you. Um, If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to subscribe to the Cars Guide YouTube channel so you can stay on top of all our latest content. Tell your friends. Uh, But before we go, took the shell off my racing snail earlier this week, thinking it would make him faster. If anything, made him more sluggish. (laughs) 